All right, so in the last video, we just ended on describing the distribution and using comparative language. So I just wanted to quickly take a look at the spread and the outliers just to see how the comparative language worked in those two cases. So for the spread, just take a look and notice how it says the household sizes for South African students in context vary more. There's your connecting comparative language with a number involved than for the UK students from two to six people. Notice the outliers, there don't appear to be any outliers in the distribution. Um, however, there's your comparative language right there. The South African distribution seems to have two outliers on the right tail. And whenever you talk about outliers, make sure you specifically state where they are at 15 and 26 people. So don't just state that there are outliers, please make sure you state at 15 and 26 people. All right, so another way that you'll see um, data displayed is through a stem and leaf plot. So what they do is they just give us a quick picture of a distribution. The nice thing about a stem plot is that it shows us the actual data numerical values. Um, you've done this in the past before, so just remember you have to separate each observation into a stem and a leaf. So the stem is your initial digit, the leaf is the final digit. Write all possible stems from the smallest to the largest, so you're just ordering them down in a vertical column and draw a vertical line to the right of the column and then write each leaf in a row next to the stem. Arrange the leaves in increasing order out from the stem. And we'll see what that looks like, but you've done this in the past, so hopefully this is just a quick review of what a stem and leaf plot is. The most important thing is to make sure you provide a key that explains in context what the stem and leaves represent. So don't just write one vertical column two equals 12. Well, what does it equal? 12 iPods, 12 computers, 12 pieces of Snickers, whatever. Make sure you include what that is and make sure you also provide a um, title for your graph. All right, so let's just take a look at this. Um, I want you to try this. So this data represents the responses of 20 female AP statistics students on how many pairs of shoes do you have? So here are the number of shoes that some females have. Um, make a stem and leaf plot out of it, but don't forget to include your key in context and the labels. If not, you will lose points. So go ahead, hit pause, draw it, and then come back and see what your answer looks like. All right, so your stems, remember, are your first numbers. I always start, actually what you could do is you could type this into your graphing calculator into list one and um, put list ascending so you can list it from the lowest to the highest. And notice the one, two, three, four, and five are all of the numbers in your front. Your leaves are all of the numbers after it. And you want to make sure that they're actually in increasing order. So I automatically, I don't put them like this. I just go straight to the order of the leaves. So that would be like your 13, 13, 13, 15, 19, 22, 23. All right, now notice the key 4-9, don't just say 49. It's that a female student has 49 pairs of shoes. And then just make sure that you have a horizontal label on the top of your graph. All right, so when data values are bunched up, sometimes we can actually get a better picture of taking a look at the distribution by splitting the stems. So what does that mean to split the stems? We're gonna take a look at what that looks like. So two distributions of the same quantitative variable can be compared using back-to-back -back stem plots with a common stem. So this is basically, um, when data is bunched up, so these are two different things. This is actually sort of having two ones and then having your leaves coming off of the two different ones with a back-to-back -back stem plot. The stem is in the middle and then there's two dist different distributions on the right and on the left-hand side. All right, so let's take a look at the difference between males and females with the number of shoes that they own. So split stems looks like this, where I have two zeros, two ones, two twos, two threes, two fours, just so it's not quite so bunched up. Um, and same thing that we did with the males, because notice if I had all of these with the zeros, that line, that list could be pretty big. And with the females, what I did was we split the stems. Now we're actually putting them with a back-to-back -back stem plot on the other side. So this allows us to compare the distribution really easily. So we can obviously see that males have a much lower number of pairs of shoes than the females do. Um, that's very easy to see, and it's very easy to see what the largest number is for females, which is um, 57. Just don't read it backwards. Um, versus the males, which is uh, 38. So the back-to-back -back stem plots give us a good comparison of data. 
Always make sure you include your key and your title on the top. All right, so what, what do we use histograms for? So you'll actually probably see most of the time histograms, box and whisker plots, and dot plots. So those are your three major ones. Quantitative variables can take on many values. A graph of the distribution can often be clearer if we group the data together. So maybe we don't need to see every single individual data point. Maybe we need to group it together just to get a general idea of what the distribution looks like. When we want to do that, we'll create a histogram. And the histogram is the one that you will see the most often. Key in making a histogram is making sure that you divide the data into classes of equal width. So what does that mean? So that means that you don't want to have one width of your histogram from 0 to 5 and the other one from 5 to 6. You want to make sure that they're all the same. So 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, so on and so forth. <clears throat> make sure that you find the count or the percent of the individuals in each class. So the class is basically just the width of your bin. So how many are in each of those bins? Please label and scale your axes. So you need a numerical label on your horizontal and vertical axis when you draw the histogram. You also need a label that describes, so like I call it a numerical label and an actual label, like a label in context to describe the vertical and the horizontal part of your histogram. Please make sure that your height of the bar equals the frequency. So if there are five within the category, make sure your bar goes up to five. Bars should always touch. If they don't touch, that means the class contains no individuals. So a gap in the graph means that it has a frequency count of zero. So in a bar graph, it doesn't mean that, but in a histogram, it does. There's no one right choice for the classes of histograms or how far apart they are. Um, just you have to get a good idea. You have to just get good at recognizing what a good histogram looks like and a bad one. If you have too few, it's just going to look like a tall sky skyscraper. It's going to group it all into one big column. And if you have too many, it's going to be way too complicated. And it's not necessarily going to give you a good overall picture of what your data looks like. All right, so we're just going to take a minute and draw a histogram based on um, the percent of residents from various states who are born outside of the United States. Make sure, what's key? Number one, label your axis. X and Y axis, you have to label it numerically and can and in context. So this is just a count. So the class 0 to 5, so that's going to be um, what percent of people were born outside the United States. So 0 to 5 percent, 20 states have that. 5 to 10 percent were born outside the United States, 13 percent have that. 10 to 15, 10 to 15 were born outside the United States, 9 have that, so on and so forth. So notice what the, um, the axes look like. The percent of foreign born residents, that's what your classes are. Okay, so 5% born outside between 5 and 10, between 10 and 15. And this is the number of states, that's your count. So between 0 and 5% were born outside the US. 20 of the states had that had that percent of foreign born residents. So just make sure you include your labels. All right, what would it look like if it was a relative frequency graph? Now remember, a relative frequency graph, graph finds the percents of the data. So instead of saying the count or the number of states over here, this would be the percent of states. So if you remember here, we had 20. Okay, there was 20 states that had from 0 to 5. So to get that percent, you would take 20 divided by the total number of states, which is 50, which gives us 40% of the states. So now we're comparing percents instead of the actual counts. So remember, a relative frequency graph compares the percent in each class to the total. The bars represent the percent that fall within each class. So just think of the class as like a bin, or you could call it the bin width. Relative frequency histograms are often more useful than frequency histograms because what we can do is we can compare two distributions, even if they're completely different, the individuals are different, the, um, the way that we collected the data is different because we're looking at a percent over the whole. And just remember, it always has to add up to 100%. All right, please make sure you don't confuse histograms and bar charts. Notice down here, if we're looking at the percent of foreign-born residents, that means right here, this class right here, zero, that means there are no percent of foreign-born, there are no states that had that particular percentage. So that means that that frequency count is zero, all right? 
in a bar graph, when there is a gap between the graphs, it does not mean that. Remember, histograms are taking a look at distributions of quantitative variables. All right, bar graphs are specifically categorical variables. Okay, the horizontal axis of a bar graph identifies the um, categories or quantities being compared. So, like your bins, what were the label of your bins, and a um, <coughs> A histogram down here is not, it's going to be putting the counts within each bin. All right, now I know that this slide can be a little bit confusing. Just make sure that you don't use counts in a frequency table or percents in a relative frequency table. So below, here's a frequency table displaying the lengths of the number of letters of the first 100 words in a journal article to display the data. So this is basically like saying the length was one, there was a count of one. The length was two words, there was 15 of those words. Three words, there were 25 of those words. Now if you take a look at the histogram, what did he do wrong? What did Billy do wrong. He used the counts as data. So basically what he did, if you're looking between 0 and 3, he said how many are between 0 and 3 words. He said 1, 2, 3. There was only 3 of them between 0 and 3. How about between 3 and 6? Okay, there was only 2 of them. 3 and 5. How many between 6 and 9? All right, there was 1, two, three. He used the counts in order to put them into the bins. Okay, so just be careful with that, that you're um, drawing them correctly. When you have, when you're taking a look at different at distributions with different number of observations, please make sure that you use percents because percents sort of standardize it and all make it a percent of 100. So if you take a look at these two graphs down here, Mary was interested in comparing the reading levels of a medical journal and an airline's in-flight magazine. In this one, the first one, she counted the number of letters in the first 200 words of the airline article, but only counted them a hundred words, or sorry, 200 words of the medical journal, but only a hundred words of the airline journal. If you take a look at this, this graph is misleading because it compares frequencies, but obviously this graph is going to have much higher frequencies because we looked at 200 words versus this graph that only looked at 100 words. So obviously it's very easy to see that in this bin there is a length of words that are about 50 are much higher than the length of words that are 50 in this one, but that doesn't give us a good representation because I only counted 100 words and I counted 200 words. So obviously there could potentially be more. Um, in my article that I counted 200 words. However, if I change that to percents, it's all comparing the percent to the whole, to 100%. So now these are much easier to compare. So if we take a look, this is telling us that um, there were two, Okay, right here, this is showing us that this percent is only about 15%, where that's not too much higher than this one down here, which is about 10%. So we're, we now have sort of a standardized way to compare them. Okay, um, just make sure that when you have a graph and it looks nice that it's not necessarily a meaningful display of the data. So the students in a small statistic class recorded the number of letters in the first name. So one student entered it into an Excel spreadsheet and got a bar graph. Now, it's not really a bar graph or a histogram, it looks like a bar graph, but both of these types of graphs display the number or percent of individuals in a given category. So this just says student one, how many letters were in their first name, student two, how many letters were, that's not a bar graph or a histogram. If you wanted to correctly display that, you would do the length of the name, you would do a dot plot, so the length of the name, and then how many students had um, a first name length of one, of two, of three, of four, of five, etc. Okay, so just make sure when you're doing histograms, don't confuse histograms and bar charts, don't use counts. Um, use percents instead of counts on the vertical axis when you have distributions with different number of observations, so like 100 versus 200. Just because a graph looks nice it doesn't necessarily mean it's a meaningful display of the data. And just so you know, for this course, in the PowerPoints, I will be going over how to do stuff on the TI-84. If you want the TI-89 instructions, you'll need to go to the calculator instruction folders on Blackboard. 
All right, so in the next section, we're going to take a look at the following information. Um, so be on the lookout for the video.